In this video, Matt Pohl tells us how the history of collecting Aboriginal artefacts has been unethical and problematic. Usually, Aboriginal peoples have been excluded from any involvement in the collection and display of their artefacts, which has resulted in cultural and historical biases. Matt talks about the collection of stone tool artefacts held in the Maclay Museum at the University of Sydney. The stone tools show interesting trade routes and systems of trade and highlight how the embedded knowledges in these items bring a greater understanding of local history. Matt discusses how museums are engaging in better consultation processes with Aboriginal communities and how this cross-cultural collaborations mean that Aboriginal peoples are able to tell their own stories. Matt discusses how museums are engaging in better consultation processes with Aboriginal communities and how this cross-cultural collaborations mean that Aboriginal people are able to tell their own stories. There has been a long history of unethical engagement where non-Indigenous authors, academics, different sort of people have taken information and used it to advance their own career and the people that the information was taken from never benefited in any sort of way. Especially since uh, the self-determination movement in the 60s and 70s, museums have recognised that Aboriginal people play a vital role in telling these histories on their own terms and in ways that are suitable to them. So it's a matter of consultation being shown in the way that these are exhibited. Sometimes we might do some consultations with a community who will give us information that this is associated with men's business or women's business, so it shouldn't be stored on the same shelf or it shouldn't be exhibited next together, next to each other in, in the exhibition space. Um, there's really great ways that Aboriginal communities have wanted to engage with the collections that have helped us be much more ethical in the way that we can share them with other Aboriginal communities as well and use that as a template for teaching and using it to allow Aboriginal students to base their own research around these practices and use that as a template to sh possibly share with other First Nations people around the world as well. When you think about how people survived for over 60,000 years, massive intergenerational migrations to every part of the country, um, one of the most common pieces of evidence that you find of that is stone tool artefacts. You find incredible assemblages of all different sorts of tools right across the country. And when you actually look at them closely, there's all sorts of knowledges embedded in the actual tool itself. So what we wanted to do with this show was show some various toolkits from different parts of the country and take them out of their archaeology classification, which can be sort of dry scientific terminology. So we wanted to group the stone tools by language region to show the toolbox and the toolkit and the different types of knowledges that people were using to make tools to aid in their survival. And also they're just sophisticated little pieces of craftsmanship as well. There's some real sculptural properties to some of the tools and a real art form that is one of the incredible arts in the history of survival in Australia. If you go to any museum in the world, you'll find an assemblage of Aboriginal stone tool artefacts. I think some people have done some audits and there's probably 100,000 of them or more circulating in museums from Chicago, Paris, um, Helsinki. In Sydney, we know there's at least seven main language groups, possibly a lot more. So from the mountains to the coast, you find different tools being traded from east to west, from north to south. Then we have one stone axe, which was found in Springwood up in the Blue Mountains, which is west of Sydney which was studied and the actual stone that it's made from comes from Kayama, which is around 400 kilometers down the coast away. So we're actually able to reconstruct these ancient trade routes and show systems of exchange where it's either one person bringing the item or people are exchanging it in between and bringing it into the Sydney region. That was found in a site that was, it was found about two feet below the surface, which places it at around two to 3,000 years ago. So when we do proper community consultation with local community members and have the appropriate, appropriate ethical clearances to do studies, we can actually give really important information back to communities. But the other thing is, this isn't new to a lot of Aboriginal people. It's just that it's been passed on through oral traditions. So one of the funny things is we do all these advanced scientific things and then we give it back to an elder who says, yeah, well, I always knew that there were those sort of things. But in a lot of ways, it, needs, it, it, it goes through this scientific validation process to prove it to the wider community. 
I think one of the interesting things about this exhibition is the way that we grouped them by the different regions around the country. Stone tool technologies can be a bit of a dry subject for a lot of um, especially younger audiences I guess. So to be able to look at a specific region and show just how people may do with their local environment and how they sustainably access to these resources is really important, I think. There's a lot of environmental knowledges embodied in them showing the type of plants they were gathering or the type of animals they were using to hunt with them as well, which shows, tells us a lot about the type of landscapes that Aboriginal people were living in. One of the main thrusts of the exhibition is to be able to bring a real local history and show how even the most ordinary looking stone tool can embody all these different facets of information which are really important to preserve and keep Aboriginal knowledges alive and continuing into the future. Sadly what's missing from a lot of museum collections is the the fibres and craft work and textiles which a lot of Aboriginal women were making. Um, it's a real historical bias which is missing from a lot of early collections and why it's so important to engage with modern communities and allow men, women, young people, older people to engage with the museum in their own ways and uh, give us an impression of the type of things that they would like to see their culture representing. So um, there is sometimes real historical biases <laughs> represented in collections and it's something to take into account into why there's so many spears and boomerangs and clubs and different things like that that um, are held in museum from a particular time period and something that museums today are very actively correcting. So there's some big changes coming up uh, with our museum here. And interestingly, there's been big changes internationally as well. So I think a lot of ethnographic or museums that hold ethnographic collections are recognizing the importance of allowing Aboriginal and Torres Strait and First Nations people to have a, a greater say in the way that exhibitions are designed so that it's not non-Indigenous people authoring representations of Aboriginal culture, but it's Aboriginal people themselves telling their story the way that they want to tell it. So with the plans for the new museum project, it's at a, come at a really great time. We've been able to develop some really great relationships with the different community representatives who have all sorts of ideas about the ways that these different types of materials can be exhibited. We can exhibit some of our stone tool materials against uh, stone tool materials from the Paleolithic period in Europe or from the South Pacific as well. It's about um, cross-cultural collaboration and that's where I think we can see some really interesting ways to create new dialogues about what these, in, what these items mean and what they mean to Aboriginal people so that they can um, tell their story in a better way than has been told in the past. Yeah, yeah, yeah.